One sec. So any questions, doesn't matter what it's on. I'm going to be covering some specifics of the anatomy in pitching. I want to make sure I get everybody's um, little... I basically want to make sure I can see everybody one second. Bring, start bringing in your questions, though. How's everybody's Thanksgiving? And trying to get my panel up for YouTube. So what's up with Instagram? Adam, you gonna come over and help me? So what's up, everybody? Probably not going to have as many people. What's up, Brian? If you could add anything into your program, if you had a, all the resources, what would you add? It's a good question. I've been doing this for 12 years. I don't know if I'd add anything right now. You know, every time we've come across something that I feel is bring, you know, innovative, adds a lot of value, and it really works in our, our the foundation of our methods. We I build it in. Um, and that's been the cool thing, you know, because I did this as a player. I developed this as a player. The, the core foundation really hasn't changed because I believe the ground-up kinetic chain principles that I built it on are something that's going to hold strong uh, even as things, you know, more technology comes out. So I've been fortunate enough to really keep the core and haven't messed with the core. A lot of the new things we bring up, brought in, I remember when Kelly Start years ago really started to innovate mobility training and uh, bringing in a lot of the banded work, I, you know, we built that stuff in, which was really cool to use. Um, but no, I mean, if, unless I'm missing something right now, everything's been, you know, pretty legit and has done really well. We've had a lot of success. You know, when you have over 100 uh, plus, 90 plus testimonials, you know, you're obviously doing something right. And, uh, but I'm, I'm open to anything. It's one of those things where I'm really open to anything. Definitely not open to contraindicated things, things that actually take away from what we're doing. A lot of people yeah. don't understand that. Yeah. It's not always good just to build everything in yeah. because yeah. some yeah. things work against other things. Some things are just oh. kind of better oh. left oh. by themselves, and sometimes you got to build a Five. method out of, out of those Four. things. Three. Two. Let's see, 5'9 pitcher, you posted. How old is he and what grade? Um, which 5'9? Are you talking about who was the 5'9 pitcher? Oh, was that Dom? Dom's uh, 19. I think he's 19 or 20. Uh, he's, you know, underclassman in college. Um, I think that if that's the one you were talking about, he came on earlier. What are submaximal holds and how long should they be? So a submaximal hold is when you load up the amount of weight that is listed in that rep or in that set and you drop a few inches, just a few inches, to turn the, the, say, in a squat position, to turn the musculature on, to start holding that load and firing at that load, and then you rack it. You hold it for about five seconds. It just, what it does is it just turns on more motor units, um, prepares you for that weight. It's kind of like you ever done the first set, and the first set is always harder than the second set. That's post-activation potentiation, meaning it, it, you basically you turn on all these muscles, and the next time through, your body, if it's still hard, maybe it needs to turn more on. So sometimes that first set is always a set where your body starts gauging how you're going to move the rest of the, of the training, and, you, and your body builds up that. That's why a lot of times your first set is your hardest, because your body hasn't, you know, more effectively or um, effectively gained or gauged how that training or that, how much loading that or how much power that movement needs. So that's the submaximal hold approach. So as far as like things with anatomy, I thought would be fun talking about. Um, saw a good thing on Instagram the other day. Someone sent to me talking about abduction and how abduction uh, of the back hip is important to building the lateral movement. If you don't allow this hip to abduct, which would be if you can see Jimmy here, if you don't allow this hip to lift up like this, then you're not going to allow the lateral movement and how important the lateral movement. I, th I think that that um, post overvalued the lateral movement. If you look some of my research, the lateral movement 
is not as highly correlated to ball velocity as the sagittal movement, as the, the, the more vertical movement. It's because, and a lot of people ask that, why is the lateral movement, which you know, the majority of your delivery as you're striding where you abduct this leg to keep your hips moving forward, why is that not as valuable as the vertical movement, which is a more lifting up movement? Because where do we do that in the pitching delivery? No one can think of that, but it happens really big in that front leg. When that front leg lands, that pushback, that front leg extension really accelerates the trunk. That's a big vertical movement. But why is that more valuable than the movement initially in the delivery going down the mound? Is because the extension aspects of both movements. So let me put this down. If you look at, even in a lateral movement, you extend your knee and ankle. So this here, specifically look at the knee, this extension would create the vertical power movement. But if my femur is abducted like this, that extension also creates the lateral push or the lateral movement. So you got to understand the vertical movement should always have more, a higher correlation to overall ground force performance because it's the pushing aspects of it. Even when you're doing it laterally or you're doing it linear or vertical or, you know, or sagittal, the, it, the extension component is in both of those movements. So uh, lateral is important. Really, only a f what would correlate uh, lateral would be the abduction of the hip, which allows the hip to move laterally. If you're not abducting the hip and you extend, you move vertical. But if you're abducting the hip and you extend, now you move lateral. So you, you got to understand the extension component, which drives pretty much all of the vertical sagittal movements, is also very much driving the lateral movement. It's why it's probably going to correlate higher um, based on just on that theory, understanding it that way. So abduction, remember that. Abduction would be a key part of the anatomy that allows at a leg lift, allows you to start falling and moving down the mount. If you don't abduct this hip, this hip stays you know, down or adducted, then what happens is you're going to want to collapse your back leg, you're going to want to rotate quickly, and you're not going to really build a lot of lateral energy. So learn how to abduct the hip. Abduct the hip as you move allows you to use more of the lateral movement, which is important. Getting some hearts on Periscope for that, I appreciate it. Let's see, what other questions do we have? A lot of people timing in, not a lot of questions. What's up, Victor? Victor Black on the line, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, everybody must be tired from uh, Thanksgiving or zombie-like, not as getting as many questions as I normally do. Let's go to some more abductions. So, in with the hips, people talk about hip rotation. So, there's you can get confused in hip rotation. Hip rotation could be the hips turning, you know, this way, swiveling this way, or hip rotation could be right here in the femur going internal like this to external. Okay, so that's typically when I refer to. Um, I guess hip rotation, I'm typically talking to the swiveling of the hips. If I'm talking uh, rotation internal to external, I typically call that, you know, rotation of the leg, femur rotation. But understand, um, really more of this movement here, when your feet are down, is going to be driven by the femur, or it's going to be a, a kind of a leftover result of the trunk. It's hardest to sit here and swivel your hips uh, without... I mean, it has to, your lower half has to move to create that movement. So really, truly, medically, hip rotation would be internal to external rotation, okay? Um, and then in biomechanically, we can think of it as a segment, and that segment rotating, but uh, anthropometrically, or in the, the, the movements of the body, that just doesn't really happen independently. That's usually driven by the femurs and the legs. So some pitching one-on-one -on -one, uh, anatomy, uh, information. If anybody has any other more questions on that, let me know. What's up, Vic? How was Christmas? Or how, not Christmas, how was Thanksgiving? Getting ready for Christmas. All right, we got another question. Any thoughts on shoulder rotation like Mad Bum? So, shoulder rotation, talking about Madison Bumgardner. I guess I'm trying to figure out what you mean by any thoughts on shoulder rotation like Mad Bum. So, um, I guess when I think of Madison Mumgarman, I think of a very rotational pitcher. Why a very rotational pitcher kind of goes to the abduction thing we were talking about. When he comes out of leg lift, he doesn't really abduct the hip. He comes out of leg lift, 
he quickly wants to open and start rotation. Well, he's a large man, and he can delay his trunk by keeping his thoracic uh, rotation closed and delayed and really build a lot of energy in rotation. And that is really what predominantly how he generates a lot of his force, purely out of rotation. See you all. Thanks for coming. Hey, thank you. We'll talk. So, um, you know, and then that's the difference between someone who's more of a rotational pitcher, would be Mad Bomb would be a good example, or a pitcher who's more linear. And I probably would go with someone like Kenley Jansen, who lifts, falls, carries a lot of momentum down the mound, a lot of distance down the mound, delays the trunk, and then transfers the trunk well. You know, Bumgarner's a guy who wants to quickly start opening front side, even though he stays way delayed, and that's why you typically see him really closed off, arm behind the head, because now he needs all the time he can get. So he gets as much rotation or much delay in his angular rotation of his trunk to generate that velocity. So he, he becomes more of a predominantly rotational pitcher. And also, too, it's probably why I think he's a good hitter, because someone who hitting is a little bit more rotational and someone who's a very powerful rotator on the mound can also be a very powerful hitter as well. Um, let's see, who should my son look up on the MLB, mechanically speaking? I think you pick someone that you watch, an idol that you watch, and you pick someone similar to your size and your ability. So, you know, if I'm a little guy, I might be following the Stroman types, the, the Sunny Gray types. If I'm a big guy, I might be following the Chapmans or um, the Kinley Jansons, the guys who are big but also move really, their big frames very well. Um, uh, to be honest, there's becoming better, a lot better movers in the big size frame guys, and I think that's ultimately why ball speeds have really exploded because you're getting these big pitchers that used to just be sloppy and could get away with everything who are now training themselves or they're a bit more athletic, they're moving a lot better, and they're you know, throwing a lot harder because potentially they have a lot more leverage. So pick somebody who you remind you or you model really well, who's someone you feel like, hey, we're not that much different body size-wise, mobility-wise, performance-wise. I mean, obviously there is a difference. That's why they're at the major league level. But ultimately you should, you'd be able to say, look, I can develop those things because we have a lot of similarities here, here, and here, and I can develop those things, and ultimately that might get to me to the big league level. Falling forward and down flexes and abducts the hip at the same rate. It does. Falling forward and down at the same rate flexes and abducts the hip. Yes, that's the purpose of taking your hips, right, and out of your leg lift and falling forward and down at the same rate. That's going to abduct the hip, and that's going to flex the leg. So now we can generate in a lateral position, lateral force production um, out, of that, out of that back side and really accelerate that energy, accelerate that momentum. Any sidearm pitchers typically rotational pitchers? Yeah, the, the why is sidearm predominantly more rotational, guys? Because if I can't, if, if, if I'm going to keep my arm below my trunk, right, then my arm's going to want to... Um, so here's the thing. If, if I keep my arm in front of, or if I'm below my shoulder, my arm's going to want to get out front early, right? As opposed to if I'm throwing more over the top. I can stay contralateral. My arm comes up. Now I can carry my trunk forward. It's harder to do that when your arm's below your shoulder to carry your arm forward when it wants to quickly wrap around your body. It, it works better over the top. You can carry it forward before it turns over and you can get a lot more trunk distance that way. So sidearm pitchers get forced to be more rotational because their trunk can't go forward in that low, when the elbow is below the shoulder or shoulder height. It's harder for them to go forward because that arm wants to wrap around at the body, cutting off the trunk going forward. It doesn't have that same effect coming over the top. So you're right, sidearm pitchers become predominantly more rotational, and that's why typically... You'll see a guy throw 95 over the top and then throw 92 or even blow in sub positions, maybe 90, because they lose all that trunk energy going forward. What do you recommend when you reach a training plateau? I recommend, um, I recommend doing something. I mean, to be honest, uh, if, if you go to, say, brute strength Olympians, I, I asked that question with Matt Bruce. I said, what do you do when you reach plateaus? Well, if they hit plateaus, they're pretty hard and they're stuck. And he says they, <clears throat> they squat till they throw up. I wouldn't recommend that, but that's something that they do privately within their, in their training environments. Mainly, I asked, I was like, why? What's the technique? What's the science behind that? And they said, there's really none. 
It's just purely mental. It's like once you do that, it just cracks and breaks you mentally, and then it allows you to go up on on another level. A plateau means your body has completely adapted to your daily routines. So if you don't, you want to go up above that you want it to force to adapt to another level your daily routines aren't enough anymore so you need to increase them we need to get more focused in specific areas that's why programming is so so important that if you don't have good programming helping you to constantly adapt 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 and get you away from plateaus um, if you're just doing a linear progression you're going to hit a plateau quick and you're going to get stuck that's why you need good programming that's why we use a periodization model with the 3x pitching velocity programs and the 2x programs more effective in helping you break plateaus. Let's see, did I miss any questions before this? I don't think I did. I got a bunch on YouTube here. Whoop, I'm getting a lot more on Instagram too. You said that more linear the force vector is the better. If the pitcher is explosive enough, what do you think is the best possible angle? So we're talking about the force vector here. We're looking at Jimmy. What's the force vector? It's the angle of the ankle to knee. So wherever this ankle to knee is pointing, right? And the pitching anatomy 101 we're going through right here. Wherever this shin is pointing or this ankle to knee is pointing, that's my force vector. That means when I extend and push through this ankle, it's going to push force up that shin. So if I want to go towards the target, I need to abduct this hip, flex, and push that force in that direction. That means my force vector needs to get linear. So what's an ideal one? Obviously, as linear as you possibly can. Most guys can't get linear enough. I'd say something like 45 degrees would be ideal. But if you go to a point where you're, you start to lose torsion, meaning you don't stay externally rotated, if you start getting internally rotated, the knee doesn't have a lot of support on the inside part. And, but that's mainly how the, the, all the ligaments tighten up. When you start turning it inward, it starts losing stability and wanting to collapse. So if you hold it outward, then you can keep stability. So a lot of times when you're trying to get a more linear force vector, sometimes because your, 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 your hips are too high, you're not abducting well, you collapse the leg. And then if your leg is collapsing internally while you're driving, you're going to break your, you know, you're going to tear your knee. Or what's going to happen is you're not going to get any power out of the ground through your hips. So it's holding torsion, getting a linear force vector. So when you push, you push it through stability and pushes and, and accelerates your hip speeds. We use your techniques in the Dominican Republic. We want, we watch the videos. Hey, that's awesome, man. I, I'm, ex, I'm excited to be sending knowledge down to you guys. Um, we always talk about how impressive y'all are and how hard y'all work down there. Keep it up. You inspire us as well. What do you recommend you when you reach a training plateau? We already talked about that. Why might my elbow hurt even though I have good hip to shoulder separation? So you could be, here's the thing. The cadavers, when they put the arm in a valgus position, it hits a point of about, they say around 82 to 85 miles an hour where the newtons of force is enough to snap the, the daver tendon, or the ligament, sorry, and tear the ligament. So it could be the point that you don't have enough grip strength. Because once you get over 82, 85, your grip strength, your bicep, your, your tricep strength kick in to compress the joint, stabilize the joint. Could be that you're pushing above that, you say you're throwing 85 plus, <clears throat> and you don't have good enough grip strength, or you don't have a good enough bicep strength. So that could be an issue. It also could be, even though you're separating, you still could be uh, uh, pushing your elbow forward. So if you don't drag your arm, then maybe you're pushing your arm. Maybe your elbow is being pushed out and you're delaying pronation. That would cause more stress. Also, too, maybe your trunk isn't really moving. You're separating and you're just rotating, and your trunk isn't going forward. Once again, it's going to force your arm to overcompensate for that energy. So hip to shoulder separation is a key component to allow all that trunk energy to go forward in the arm to ride it correctly. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. It just means it's hard to do it without that. What's the best worker for your legs to help improve velocity? We use an Olympic style approach, which you can see back there, which we find is the most effective for, an, you know, like studies show, enhancing vertical jump, increasing dynamic athletic performance. It's also highly mobile. Tra forces you into highly mobile positions, which pitchers always want highly mobile positions. So we really believe in all the Olympic lifts for this. But you do need instruction. A lot of coaches don't like them, promote them, recommend them, because it takes an, uh, a good coach to teach you how to do them correctly. Can't wait to come back. Same here, Corey. When you're coming down, man, let me know for winter break. What's a great exercise front leg stabilization? So front leg stabilization, your ability to 
to catch your momentum, um, extend back into that momentum. So studies have shown up to 250% of your body weight can be hitting your front leg. So you need to be able to, you know, catch in a one-legged lunge 250% of your body weight, right? So it is a strength and power issue, key strength and power issue. But at the same time, too, if your hips are rotating, that will really support extension because the rotation will create extension. So making sure you're timing the movement. So good exercises obviously would be, you know, any type of clean where you're catching the weight, that really trains the power. Same time, too, squatting is good for that. There is a lot of posterior chain there, too, so a lot of deadlifting. All the lower half stuff from the strength, the power stuff is going to be key for that. And then, too, working on the mobility to get hips, your, your hips to rotate well and having drills like we do with the med ball drills to train that. So we train that big time in the 3X programs. When your coach says you use your legs, what does it mean? It means you need to generate first ground force out of them. So you need to be able to push and extend through the ground. When you do that, that force coming up is worth almost twice the value of what you can create in your shoulder and elbow. So studies say if you lose 20% of the kinetic energy coming through the hip and trunk to the arm, it requires a 34% increase of the rotational velocity of the shoulder to put the same force in the hand. So if you don't get the extension power, if you're not pushing into the ground to create that energy and move your body, then you overcompensate. And that's what using your legs is, is learning how to push into the ground, create ground forces. But here's the thing, you've got to understand there's angles to that. You have to push it in the right angles, and you have to push it at the right time, or it doesn't come and doesn't move up the body, doesn't convert. We have a whole um, training series on that, topvelocity.net slash lower half, one word. Free training series on how to use the lower half. You should check it out. How often do you recommend using a radar gun to track your progress or regression? So pretty much we use like the pocket radar gun all the time. If, uh, if you guys, we have a, for the smart uh, radar, which is really cool, has an app, shows you it, it, it charts all of your velocity on it for you through the app. It's the, called their smart coach. Go to pocketradar.com. I'm not supposed to say this, don't tell anybody, but use the, uh, use the code TOPVELOSC for um, smart coach then it'll give you a, a discount on it. But highly recommend that radar. And yes, use it as much as you can in your drills. I don't like using it on the mound that much. Just use it in your drill. What's your record for separation in med ball throws? So the highest we've had in here is 49 on that one. I threw four miles per hour with the med ball drill. How fast do you think I could be, should be throwing? No, you throw 41 with the med ball throws. I would say you can double it. You know, So you could say 82. But it doesn't mean, it just that's a range. You could be at 78, you could be at 85, but we just say double it. You might be somewhere around there. Um, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. What is the best drill to learn triple extension through the back leg? You know, first of all, making sure you have the power, making sure you understand ground force, how to react with the ground. We use the king of the hill plates, topvelocity.net slash KOH. Really great because it gives you feedback on how you're pushing into the ground. As far as really getting into the essence of triple extension, that's Olympic lifting. Learning to do clean pulls, uh, hang cleans, power cleans, and, and really focusing on bar height. We don't do a lot of full cleans or full clean, you know, clean to front squats because we want guys throwing the bars as high as they can to really make sure we're emphasizing power production. All right, we got more here. Not a lot of guys on Periscope. What well, do? To what extent does weight have on velocity? So I, my data didn't find a high correlation, but there is studies that show there was a, that basically out of pitchers, those who weighed the most or were larger tip, tended to throw the ball harder. On average, doesn't mean you have to weigh a lot to throw hard, it just means on average, if you get a group of guys, typically the guys who are bigger throws harder, and it's hard to get away from that. Do you come to Virginia? We haven't come to Virginia. We haven't had a request to, maybe, uh, maybe it'll open up, but no, we don't have anything on the books as of yet. Um, where should your scat be positioned during layback? So let's talk about uh, layback here. So when we lift the arm above the head, the scaps have to, to clear what's called the chromial space. So if you see right here, the end of the humerus, uh, when this lifts up, the the clavicle there grinds right into that bone. We've got to be careful there. That's how I tore my rotator cuff when I was in college, was this continuing of uh, lifting and grinding and rotating into pretty much the shoulder bone. 
So the, what we have to make sure is happening is the scap has to upwardly rotate. If it doesn't upwardly rotate when we lift the arm up, then we're going to not have enough room there to avoid what's called impingements. So you've got to train that, guys. It, your arm just doesn't all of a sudden one day figure out how to upwardly rotate. That takes a lot of superior strength in the shoulder. That's why we believe in a lot of overhead work because I want to be able to not only push weight up here, but I want to be able to stabilize weight up there because then I know my scaps can get in that position and hold weight in that position, and that's what's going to happen when I throw a ball uh, above my head. So we've got to train that. So the scaps have to upwardly rotate. They have to protract right, a, a little bit um, and, and almost suck under slightly to stabilize underneath the, the shoulder to create that little cup, like someone's literally just putting their hand under your shoulder and giving you that stability. So, like I said, you have to train that. You, any, so doing overhead work, which a lot of coaches steer you away from, would be key. If I could train a lot of overhead positions, holding, walking in those holds, lifting in those holds, and it takes time. It's something I have to build up over time. This is going to be ideal to protecting your shoulder and arm when you start throwing uh, specifically hard and a lot. See, what, that's what I mean because I saw Randy Johnson was 37 degrees and the average is 17. I don't know where that went to. What are your thoughts on pitchers throwing 100% all game compared to pitching in the past who didn't try and throw as hard as every pitch? I find, I kind of feel like injuries just keep going up year by year. Yes, there is a correlation to your amount of intensity to um, your, your injury rate or your wear and tear. You know, here's the thing. If you are trained to do that, then you should be able to survive it. Um, everyone has a threshold if you're doing good stress management. The Moda Sleeve does a good job of that. They look at your amount of throws over time, and they're, not, they're looking for drops and spikes. So meaning like if you took four days off, it wouldn't be good to come in and throw a 100-pitch 100, 100 game. You know, you want to make sure if you take a lot of days off, you've got to slowly build back up. And if you're not, and you know, if you're every, throwing every other day, you don't make these big jumps. If you want to go up to 100 pitches, you've got to slowly build up to 100 pitches. You can't just jump to 100 pitches. So getting better at stress management, and, if you're, and that's the thing. If you're, going to, if you're going to want to come out and be 100% every time, you need to train for that. You can't just you know, have a lazy offseason, jump into season, and hope you survive. You're just going to fall apart. It's something you have to train for that, and that's the problem. I think that's more of the problem. Guys want to throw hard now all the time, and I get that. But it's just people don't know how to train to do that. So it's not the fact that we shouldn't be throwing hard all the time. It's that people need to know how to train for that and get their bodies primed to be able to handle that kind of stress. I know it's not pitching and anatomy, but it's been on my mind all week. Okay, best weighted ball drills. So we don't do weighted balls. We, we do a, well, technically we could say we do. We do a weighted med ball and a two-handed drill. We don't do a weighted baseball drill. Because in a weighted baseball drill, it's one arm. You can, the arm path can basically be out of sync with the delivery. We can do things uh, incorrectly, like pull the glove really aggressively and let the arm drag, and that's just going to load so much stress in your arm. If you add weight to that, it makes it even worse. So to avoid that, we use a two-pounded throw if we're going to do the overload approach uh, with two hands so the arm stays engaged and I'm throwing it more with my trunk and not my arm. And really, if you're going to do any type of loading on the ball or the end, you need to make sure you do it uh, with the trunk driving that energy, not the arm driving that energy. And that's the severe problem with high tent weighted baseballs is you're trying to use the arm to generate uh, that, you know, handle more of that load or generate more velocity. Um, and and it, it typically dis can easily disengage. If it doesn't, you can stay healthy. That's why not everybody gets hurt. But if it doesn't disengage, or if it does disengage, you're going to be in severe trouble. And that's why I don't like the risk. I don't like the risk in a method to where if I don't do it perfectly right every time, I just might have ended my career. I, it's not a place to be. Um, what med ball drill do you all do for both for arm path? So we typically do in the 3X pitching velocity programs, the external and internal rotation throws, we'll do them with baseballs. Med balls, we'll do them with footballs. And it's training the forearm rotation, the shoulder to forearm rotation in sync, right? Work, that working together. And then we go through things in separation where we add... Uh, we learn about arm cock timing at front foot strike and how the arm follows the trunk and how the trunk really drives the energy to the arm. Uh, all in the program, 
uh, through a few drills to really get that to sync up. And then it's all about getting the energy up. If you get the energy up and you know where everything needs to be at the end, it all starts to accelerate really well and sync together really well. Any idea or ideas on gripping for a slurve or a curveball? I don't do a lot of grips, but we do have David Arzmo, 10-year big leaguer, played for 14 different MLB teams. We have his pitch grips course, topvelocity.net slash pitch dash grips. He did like 14 pitches. It's really awesome what David did. Uh, David played with pretty much everybody back in the day, so he has some good stories, and he learned from a lot from different guys like Greg Maddox, Mariano Rivera, um, some pretty good, cool stuff. Um, let's see. If I throw 92, can I increase velocity with your program? Yes, anyone can increase velocity with the program. The goal with the 3x pitch velocity program was to optimize the you individually. So how could I individually optimize you? I have, when I have a big leaguer come in, I can quickly get him struggling because I can see where his issues are and I can isolate those issues. Even though that guy might throw 95, 100 miles an hour, I can still say, hey, look, you're, there's some issues here that you're not fully optimized. Here's my thing, if you're not fully optimized, you, you might still throw hard, but you're gonna get hurt, or you're not gonna last as long. Um, so the point is, like, our focus is anyone who comes in here. You know, we had Trevor Rosenthal come in here throwing 100 miles an hour, and we helped him as best we could. We helped him significantly. So that, that's the thing, it doesn't really matter how hard you throw. It's just, if you really think you're, you have more on the table, you're not fully optimized, we definitely can help you. And I, to be honest, that's most guys that come in here. I've been doing the lower half drills, and I've noticed that I've had a lot of tightness when trying to get into torsion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you've got to understand here, and this is a key thing in the anatomy, is this bone right here is so significant to your health as a pitcher. There's a study that showed uh, a direct correlation to hip tightness to shoulder injuries. Uh, I had a shoulder injury, and I have incredibly tight hips. Here's the problem. Not only can you have all this tissue in here creating tightness, but you can have a short basically end uh, of, of, the, of the femur. But see, the femur comes up and then it kicks in. So it comes up and then it kicks into the socket. Well, if you have a really short head here, then you're not gonna be able to lift a duck that well because you don't have much room. Now, if I had a big head out here, I could come up all day. So the thing is, is if you don't have muscular or, or anatomy that really supports a lot of mobility there, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna really struggle. And then what happens is, is you know, we can work with this. There might be some tissue limitations here, adduction limitations, or even abductor weakness that can improve that. Just the glute alone can put the hip in a better posture. A lot of times when you get in these bad postures, this position here shuts off all that mobility in that hip socket. So getting the glutes on and strong and getting your hips in a better posture, that's huge for opening up your hips and getting, making it easier for you to get down and start using your lower half. So. Those are the things that need to be dressed. You need to be dressing, obviously, the mobility there, but first the posture. Do I have a good enough posture to create stability for all that mobility? And then am I mobilizing that joint, strengthening that joint to be able to handle moving through full ranges of motion, being able to move through the full range of motion um, and, you know, explosively to support the rest of the body? Here's the thing. If this joint can't move and mobilize, if it's stuck, then what, you're gonna, what do you think you're going to do up here? You're going to take this joint and you're going to try to over-mobilize it. So that's why people fall into injury. What they do is they have really tight hips, but all they hear is layback. I've got to get more layback. And then they go out there and use high intent throws or heavy weighted balls to try to get more layback. And what they're doing is trying to over-mobilize over this joint because these joints are so weak and immobile. And then all of a sudden you tear this joint because it's trying to go so far to gain range uh, and not really you know, the rest of the body is not supporting that, and then it gets injured. So you really need to tap into all your joints, optimize all your joints, so everything can work together like a whip, right? Distribute energy equally, and more efficiently transfer more power, and so where you increase your velocity and you stay healthy. Let's see, we got, you're going to the game day USA event in Orlando on Christmas break? No, I am not. I, I don't even know about the event. Uh, maybe we should. Tell me all about it. And it. Is incline dumbbell bench press, incline barbell bench press good for pitchers in general? All upper body strengthening is good for pitchers. It needs to be, you know, in balance with other pulling lifts. But it's all very important. And it should not be pushed quickly. You should slowly build that strength, specifically in your overhead, specifically if you're throwing a lot. 
and, and always it is good to build strong overhead strength. The majority of pitchers I find have really weak overhead strength and a lot, a lot of injury problems. I remember when I was, before I tore my rotator cuff at 18 years old, I could barely hold my arms over my head, they get so tired. Well, no wonder I tore my rotator cuff. I mean, that's not the only reason, but it had a lot to do with it. Yes, we need a lot more overhead strength. It's very much undervalued in the game, almost deterred, right? They don't want you to actually develop overhead strength. It's crazy. Are your camps during the week, and what does it cover? So the camps are typical in the weekend. So the format here at Top Velocity is Monday through Friday, we have our lifting and training and throwing. It's basically our, 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 all of our training and our calendars. And Saturday, Sunday is our camps. Like tomorrow we have a camp. What do the camps do? It's an orientation. It's like you're going to college and you go to orientation to get your books, to get your syllabus, to get you know everything laid out, all your classes laid out. Then you go to class. Same thing here. You come in here on Saturday, Sunday, you get evaluated. You get a baseline of information of where you are and how you measure. Then we'll show you your goals of where you want to be. Then you get all your material and you look at how to basically, uh, you know, go through your material and follow your programming. We'll instruct you through the program to make sure you're doing it correctly. We'll instruct you through nutritional programming as well. Uh, and so then on Monday, you can get started here or on your own doing the training and making the gains that we've laid out for you. So the camp is an orientation to all this work. Does it include staying somewhere? The camp doesn't include that. The camp includes year round or basically we don't charge for training. So here's the thing. You come to camp, you get all the training included here uh, whenever you need it. If you do want to stay here, we do have housing. We have, um, Stephen has a house, I have a house. We have someone else that has a house. Those fill up fast, but that's separate. If you need more information on the housing, just DM me. I'll get you information on the housing as well. It says, uh, the event is a week-long event that, that's the USA event in Orlando. It's a week-long event that selects kids get invited to, and scouts will be there with other professional coaches and in five. Um, well, that sounds pretty cool. I wonder where is it in Orlando? 15 playing on the 18 team. Ricardo asks, how many books come with the 3X Velocity program? So the 3X Velocity program has the, the extreme program has the um, beginner guide, the 3X pitching uh, book on just covering the basics of the approach. It has the mechanics guide one, mechanics guide two. It has the ace pitcher handbook, the level two off-season training, level three, preseason training manual, in-season training manual, uh, USA beginner training, and a, a starter kit. So all those manuals you get, plus all the instructional videos to go with it, which is, I think, over 700 instructional videos that go with it. This is going to be a career's worth of training for you. How fast could they, for the guy throw who hit the 49 in med ball separation? Um, 93, he's little. That's the thing is, he was below, I'd say, uh, that doubling range. He, he I wouldn't say he's little, but he was below six feet. Um, Oh, actually, wrong way. He wasn't little. He was 6'2". He's about 2'30". He's bigger. So sometimes the bigger guys can throw the med balls harder. If he was a little guy, he actually probably would have potentially been able to throw a baseball harder. Um, we had another guy. He threw 48. He was a big guy, too. He was like a 92 guy. Um, I haven't really had any, like... Let's see, Victor. Victor would sit... You know, Victor's a 100-mile-an-hour guy, and he'd sit 44 to 46 yeah. with it. Um, so he and he wasn't, you know, he's an average-sized guy. Um, it just, like I said, they're going to kind of be all over the place, but they're definitely 90-mile-an-hour guys. So. Do you have, believe any player has perfect mechanics in MLB? No, I wouldn't say they have perfect mechanics. I think everybody can be optimized and learn and improve and get better at where they are. Does your... Does yeah, finish the, two. Finish does two. Come on. Power clean ratio really only increase dramatically with an increase in strength. It just, there's a good base of power clean, your power clean, power to weight ratio, the, the base of that is your strength. It'd it just be hard to build a high power clean if you didn't have a lot of strength. It just, it helps at the same time too, it needs a lot of speed. So a lot of plyometric work helps a lot to drive up your power cleans. The jerks help a lot to drive up power clean. Because um, sometimes you can get your squats so, you know, you get it really high, but your power clean stops going up. Well, it could be just, your limit 
on the speed side. Remember, power is a combination of speed and strength. So if I can really maximize strength, maximize speed, it's going to give me more power at the end, or optimally as much power as I can get. What exercise do you recommend for strengthening your front and back hip? I notice tightness in my front leg hip side after pitching. So, you know, deep squatting, um, lunging. Uh, we do like sled work, lateral sled work. Um, all these things are really key for that. What are good body weight exercises to increase velocity? Um, plyometric work would be key. I wouldn't just stick on body weight because you'll be very limited on what you can get your body to adapt to. Someone who can load their body with more weight will adapt quicker than someone who doesn't. Do you think the top below program would be applicable for cricket fast bowling? I've, I have worked with guys on it before and it did help. Biomechanically, there's differences. But the Olympic training that we do is, would, has had a great effect with cricket bowlers. I've had a lot of them reach out to me over the years, and they've had a lot of success what? with it. What hip mo movements are involved in driving the hip open? So the anatomy and driving the hip open. So here's the thing. The hip is like a cylinder swiveling, right? If I push into the side of a cylinder, it's just going to go sideways. But if I get a little angle and I push, it's going to spin the cylinder. So we have to first get the hip to rotate open. So typically what we do is when we lift the leg and we start to fall forward and down at the same rate, the femur abducts and lifts up. And, whoops, this thing is breaking on me one second. Okay, so the femur abducts and lifts up right here, okay, to, to you know, a force vector, a good force vector angle. At the same time, too, we want to counter-rotate the hip. Counter-rotating the hip allows us to flex it. And that flexion, obviously, we're counter-rotating away from the direction I want it to spin. I want it to spin the other way around. But that allows me to load into flexion, which then it unloads into extension. And I get that little, just out of the hip, a little swivel that then when I extend into it, then I drive all that force through it and it creates a hip rotation. So it's that learning how to hold torsion to create stability in the leg, how to fall forward and down at the same rate as you duck the hip and get the force vector linear, and then how out of flexion of the hip, you unload into extension, that gets it swiveling, and then you fully extend through triple extension, and that ultimately powers the hip all the way through. That's, that's really the way to create a lot of hip rotation, power a lot of hip rotation. When do you usually see people hit 90 when they hit 1.3 power to weight ratio? So those guys that are over 6 feet, they can go 1.3. But if you're like just at 6 feet, you might have to go 1.5. Guys under 6 feet definitely need to go 1.5. Sometimes they might have to go higher than that. But you should be, when you get to 1.5, um, or if you're well over 6 feet and you get to 1.3, it shouldn't be that far away. It just comes down to, do, am I applying it through the biomechanics? See, a lot of guys who can get a good power to weight ratio, they, they don't get in the positions. They specifically don't get the femur or the force vector in the position to really drive the hip rotation to create the sequencing. So they have the power, they just can't get the body there. It's like having the, 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 the rocket launcher. I just can't get the rocket in the, in the, the nozzle to shoot out of the gun, right? So you, you, we got to put it all together. We just can't have the rocket without the ability to aim it and translate it. We've got to have it all working together, and then we'll really get what we want. Any tips for getting a part-time job to save up for your program? Yeah, I mean, I used to wait tables. I used to clean theaters. I used to uh, pick up garbage at construction sites. I used to cut lawns. I used to, um, oh, God, I mean, I did it all. I did marketing stuff. I did uh, anything I could get. I think, guys, people need work. You just go up to people and you're like, hey, uh, do you need me work? Anything I can do for you? You need me to fix something? Sometimes you got to get some skills, which helps a lot. But at the end of the day, with Google, I just tell them I can do it, and I go Google and then I, and I do it. So hopefully that helps. But, but hey, man, the discipline that you build and in investing in something is the same discipline you use in getting the most out of it and taking advantage of it. So. It's, it's got to start somewhere, and, and there's a good place to start is in you just acquiring, or you acquiring the, the money to create that investment. It's key. How do you think, what do you think, or how do you think about arm strength? Do some people have more, longer levers? So, so arm strength, let, let's just, we'll throw that out. So it's, yeah, some people have longer levers, and some people, when their muscles load, they, they can load more eccentrically, meaning they load and they get more energy out of eccentric loading. Some people, 
load eccentrically and they don't have a lot of elasticity and they don't get a lot of energy out of it. So some people use the, the force curve or the power curve better, meaning they can go deeper into eccentric energy through isometric to really accelerate through concentric. Some can't get into much eccentric and then they, they have to try to push out of that and they don't create a lot of power. So it's just some muscles load more efficiently, more dynamically than others and they have longer levers which means if I have a longer lever and I have a better loading mechanism, I'm going to throw harder. Also, too, longer levers, more mobility, more time to generate energy. All those things apply. So, and it's, it's not just this arm strength issue. I mean, it could be they have a quick upper body. I've seen guys just train their upper bodies forever and have a quick upper body, but then they get to the point where they get to 85, 86 miles an hour and they can't throw any harder because they're maxed out with their upper body. Then they got to get their lower half into it. You're always going to be better optimizing the whole body and getting the whole body to work. But don't get lost in seeing guys that are just really efficient loaders and unloaders, really lanky and lean and mobile, and see their work ethics and go, hey, this guy eats fast food and parties every night. I'm going to do that too and throw 95. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to understand where are your limitations to their limitations. You need to fill up your buckets, mobility, strength, speed, power, biomechanics, where are their buckets full? If they're full across the board and yours are like up and down, like this one's really low, this one's high, this one's low, then you got to do a better job in training to get caught up to them, which they probably haven't done anything to build that. It just came to them. It genetically came to them. So that, that's, that's the thing is you just got to make sure you're assessing who you're, who you're comparing yourself with correctly. Obviously, how, obviously lower half is the most important. Was just curious. Can you explain CNS? How it is trained? So the CNS is your software, right? It's your computer telling your body to activate certain muscles at certain times, certain speeds. So how we train that? No better way was Olympic lifting. Olympic lifting because it's multi-jointed movement. So think proprioception, meaning what's proprioception? This shoulder here, when I throw weight on it, it it activates the muscles correctly to prevent it from shooting out of the back of my shoulder. That's proprioception. That's the central nervous system knowing how to balance that joint. If I'm kicking on proprioception in every joint of my body all at once, what do you think it does to my software? It makes my software get really good at what it's doing. So Olympic lifting uses every joint through a really highly sophisticated movement. So all your joints are having to pro do fire proprioception all at once. To, so you know, you don't break a leg or you don't flip over backwards. And then all of a sudden you do that. It's some heavy weight over time. You exhaust yourself. That central nervous system, that software gets perfectly efficient and, and adapts to that. And that what's that help you in? It helps you in getting on the mound and better, more efficiently using your body to put force on the ball over and over and over again. That's how we train the CNS. Olympic lifting is probably the, the best way to do it. I'm 6'1", 170 pounds, and I'm maxed out at 85 after my freshman year. What type of increase should I shoot for? Yeah. Um, it, it left off there. It does the stupid Seymour, and I can't go down on my dad's phone. Okay. Uh, you're 6'1", you maxed out at 85 after my freshman year. So, you know, there's a big weight gain that you can make there. Obviously, that needs to be lean mass. I don't know your mobility, your strength, your power, your, your, your uh, you know, all that, your biomechanics. So just looking at one number, your, your lean mass, you potentially could gain there. Um, then you got to get all those other buckets, right? You got to get your mobility better. You got to get your strength, speed, power better. And, and you got to get your biomechanics better. And you have a lot to look forward to. Do you think weighted ball training causes glenohumeral humeral instability? Yes, I totally believe. Um, and a couple of my players have labrum tears after working with weighted ball programs in small doses. Uh, do, in small doses the past few off seasons. Yes, the studies show, if you look at the Mike Reynolds study, the guys did the study or participated in the weighted ball training, high intent weighted ball training, or, or just, I mean, it could eventually could be all weighted ball training. <coughs> the probability probably goes down. Many guys that are doing more high intent weighted ball training, the, the probability of injury goes up. Uh, and if people are doing it a little bit, like you say, smaller doses, the probability goes down, but it still means there's still a problem there. And what studies were showing, it didn't increase arm speed, it didn't increase arm strength, it creates joint laxity. So up to like 10 degrees, in one session of using, your arm laid back 10 degrees more. That laxity can be instability. It could be very much instability 
in that position, meaning like your arm was more stable here, but now that it wants to go back here, it's just, it's not, it, it didn't adapt strength. It just adapted laxity. Now it can't stabilize in that range. So it's not like, it's not like um, it became weaker in that moment. It can over time because you probably just the wear and tear. But what it did is you put it into a position it's not as strong in as it was before. And that's the problem with weighted balls. When you do that, yeah. you, you got to be very careful because you can put it in a position that it's not, that it's not prepared for. And that's why I really highly do not recommend it. Um, now, I do have it in some of my drills, like for a few throws. You know, I do kind of bring it in a little bit, seven ounces, no more. But um, you do need to take caution. Should pitchers do bull, pull downs in the offseason? No. The ASMI says do not throw more than eight months out of the year. And that means do not put the stress on your arm that you do, like you do in a game, more than eight months out of the year. So your offseason is four months and you're throwing at max intent. I mean, studies show in long toss at 120 feet, you're at 100% of the stress in your arm as you are in a game. So 120 feet, think about that. A pull down, a running gun is potentially at that same stress. So now you're not out of stress, and now you're five times more likely to have injury. You should be in a drill-based, low-stress throwing approach in the offseason, allowing your body to build and strengthen through your strength and conditioning program, improve your mechanics, and then you can start to get, you know, preseason, you can start to put in more volumes of throws and get prepared for the season. And then your arm should be ready to go at that point. But there's no need for the stress on your arm because really what needs to improve is your overall strength, your timing. And that doesn't come from trying to throw the crap out of a ball. That comes from building in the weight room, that it comes from training specific movements. Um, and that doesn't typically happen when you're out of, you're, you know, going into max effort throw. Can you name best weight lifting exercise for pitchers? Olympic lifting, that's the one I'm just gonna go to and that's a whole uh, slew of exercises and lifts and it's not just one thing guys, it really, and it's not just that, it's gotta be a fusion system like we do in the 3X Pitching Velocity program. We use a fusion of training. So topvelocity.net if you wanna learn more about it. Also topvelocity.net slash lower half, all one word, if you wanna get a free training series on how to use your lower half, it really kinda teaches you how to build the foundation of a high velocity pitcher like we do here at Top Velocity. So guys, I think this is good. This turned out pretty well. I thought it was, uh, everybody was gonna be dead asleep after Thanksgiving. I hope y'all had a great Thanksgiving. Guys, the keep of live stream Fridays. We might miss one in December because I'm gonna be in Napa. But I'm gonna keep these live stream Fridays going. It's a place for you guys to come and ask questions. So subscribe if you haven't already, just so you can get the alert on that. Um, you can email me anytime or DM me anytime. If you have questions, we have camp tomorrow. I'll be highlighting some of the camp tomorrow if you want to follow us on social media. Um, like I said, check out all the programs at topvelocity.net. We even have a, a new hitting program. I haven't got the page up for that, but if you want to check that out, that's topvelocity.net slash GFT for ground force torque. Last question, if you're a younger pitcher, should you do lifting overhead? Yes, you should. You should just start light. Probably just holding your hands up over your head is enough. But you should start light, and you should build it up like we do with the 3X Pitching Velocity program. But yes, I would highly recommend it. This is great, guys. Appreciate it. We'll see you next time.